This is the wartime history of R. G. Emmett. Uh, when, break, when war broke out, I was a clerk in a bank in Bristol. In 1915, I volunteered for service. I enjoyed as a private in the 26th Battalion, Bankers, Royal Fusiliers. Later, I was tra transferred to the 11th Battalion, Royal Fusiliers, which had suffered heavy casualties. After service in France, I was sent back to England, where I gained a commission in the 4th East Lancashire Regiment, from which I was invalided. When I joined, I was sent to the Fusiliers training camp near Loughton in Essex. We had no rifles and just did drills, forming fours, etc., route marching. Most of the other men were clerks, and etc., and I made many friends. This was my first experience of sleeping on boards. We also had to mount guard at night, but had nothing to defend ourselves with. After about four months, we were sent to a cap near Autobello, Autobello, near Edinburgh. Here we had rifles and fired our musketry course at targets at King Arthur's seat. I did pretty well at that, and was made an instructor, which meant I had to be at the front firing line all day, which was very tiring. We had a few weeks camping out, which was cold and wet. Eventually, early in 1916, we were sent overseas. <coughs> March from Portobello to Edinburgh, with many Scots girls who marched with us. Uh, the Scots, while enduring our stay, had been very good to us. Many invitations out to tea. We got down to Hoxton and went on board ship and sailed for Boulogne with a destroyer on either side. Then it was to eat up where the famous bully boys gave us all the works. We learnt to throw Mills bombs and also wore our first gas mask. We were transferred to the 11th Battalion at that time. They had suffered heavy casualties. The chief recreation in Etops was sitting round in a staminet, drinking some of the local wines. Some of the brave boys tried out the red lights and came back swanking about what they had done. One of the many lectures we had was with the medical officer who told us what not to do and tried to put the wind out us by saying what would happen if from our adventures we got a dose. We were not sorry to be sent going up to the front line. We were herded into cattle trucks and taken on a long, slow journey, passing Albert with its upside down virgin. Eventually, we got to the support lines where we would put on fatigues, carrying rations, ammunition, and other supplies up the front line. This was heavy work, often done by night, up the communication trenches, many of which had just been thrown up or dug out after the previous engagement, and were half full of men and water. We still had to carry our rifles, which often got tangled up with overhead wires carrying messages from the outposts. In one place, the hand of a buried German soldier projected out of the side of the trench 
and it was a thing to do to shake his hand as you went by. If you did not, the story was that you would be the next to be killed. One of the jobs I disliked most was carrying two gunning petrol cans full of water. Drinking water, too. Often without a stopper, which slopped all over you as you walked. The fun line in this part was fairly quiet, but the Germans had regular periods when they fired a salvo of shares. We soon learned to judge by the sound of shell was making coming, how near it was coming to us, and took cover accordingly. On one occasion, a heavy shell hit the trunk fence in front of me and blew it on top of me so that I had to be dug out. I was not hurt, but a good bit shaken. There were very few dugouts there, and what there were were just holes in the side of the trench where we put down our waterproof capes and tried to get a bit of cover when it rained. There were, of course, no laboratories, <coughs> and if we wanted one, we were supposed to go back a bit down the line get over the top and do it in the shell hole. Well, that was what we were supposed to do. Rations were mostly the old bully beef and biscuits, but after stand two in the early morning, we often got a drop of rum. After some months of more or less routine duties in and out of the trenches. We were withdrawn from the line in mid-August 1916 for a period of intensive special training in preparation for an assault on Tito. Tietlaw was an important strong point on rising ground commanding a wide area of the battlefield and had withstood all previous attacks. It had been defended throughout the Battle of the Somme by the 180th Regiment of Württembergers Brackets 26 Reserve Division, who were reputed to be so sure of their strength that they had refused to be relieved and would defend their post until the end. We were addressed by officers who told us that our artillery strength was greater than had ever been before used and this would blast the German trenches before we got there. There would be a creeping barrage of shell fire going before us, and we were to follow this closely so that the Germans would not have time to get up out of their dugouts and man their machine guns before we were on them. We were also to have the assistance of tanks, which would blast a way through for us, but those who have been in action with tanks before knew enough to keep away from them. The Germans concentrated their fire on them, and the ricochets were dangerous. These preparations built up a great feeling of tension, which was not lessened when one day we were marched out to a piece of spare ground formed up in a hollow square with our officers. The adjutant then arrived, 
we stood to attention, and with much ceremony, he read from divisional orders. On the blank day of something, 1916, five of the something regiment was tried by court martial and found guilty of desertion in the face of the enemy. He was sentenced to death, and the sentence was duly carried out on the third day of 1916. The officers then took charge and marched us back to our village. The effects of this announcement was mixed. Some were just sorry for the poor devil. Others, myself included, were inclined to doubt if it really happened and thought it was put on just for fighting us. Afterwards, I actually met the man who said he had been one of just such a firing party at the base, so maybe it was true. Still, the preparations for the great day had not finished, for we were marched out once again and lined up in battle order. The divisional commander, Major General Maxey, drove in and addressed us from the back of his staff car. The 180th Regiment of Württembergers have withstood attacks on Tietlar for two years, but the 18th Division will take it tomorrow. We did not think much of this. There are muttering, mutterings all very well for you, you old so-and-so. That night, stretched out on the floor with my head on a sack of palms, I joined in singing one of our favorite songs. I sing it. I want to go home. I want to go home I don't want to go to the trenches no more Jack Johnson's and whiz bangs they whistle and roar Take me over the sea Where the alley men can't get at me Oh my, I don't want to die I want to go home. The next day, we moved up to the front line under the deafening roar of our artillery, pounding the German lines. For this attack, our packs and greatcoats were left behind, and our haversacks, which were marked with yellow strips, were to be worn on our backs so that our planes could see how far the advance had gone and could report to headquarters. There had been a special issue of ammunition and bombs, and I went into attack carrying live Mills bombs in a small canvas sack which I carried over my right shoulder, resting on top of my haversack. Not the sort of parcel one would wish to have with machine gun bullets flying about. We were given the final ram ram ration, supposed to go into the water bottle. But in this instance, mostly drunk at once in case we never had another chance. Zero hour was at 12.35 p.m. 26 September. The officers compared watches and gave the order to advance. So we climbed out of our trenches 
and all hell was let loose. Shells crashed over and around us. Machine guns chattered as their fire swept to and fro across our path as we stumbled forward through no man's land, doubled up over the faint hope of dodging the bullets. We had been told not to budge together, as uh, that would be an easy target. So from the first, each man was on his own. Here and there were men crumpled up in the shell hole, or reading in agony, tangled up in barbed wire, some dead. The ground was uphill, and we did not have far to go to reach the German front line that had been smashed by our artillery fire, and where we found a few Germans. We shot anything that moved and dragged ourselves out over the paradox onto the next trench. We had been told to make for the ruin of a chateau, and dazed and exhausted as I was, <coughs> I dragged myself to a little hill where there was a pile of stone. All that was left of the chateau, I suppose. Here, a German machine gun fire became fiercer than ever, just sweeping above the ground. I threw myself into a shell hole, and seizing at my chance, as the bullets whistled over my head, I slid from shell hole to shell hole into a third German trench, where some of our boys were held up. Hand-to-hand -hand fighting followed, the Germans contesting every yard. Two of the officers were killed and another wounded. Eventually, the arrival of a Lewis gun team enabled us to clear the trench. This allowed us to get on with a special job our company had been given, mopping up the German dugouts, making sure there were no live Germans in them. An officer allotted each of us <coughs> a number of dugouts to clear. Well, these dugouts had been well built, very different from our scratched out holes. Real engineering jobs and many were attacked, not touched by our shelling. They were 20 to 30 feet deep and it was a perilous job tackling them. I started by shooting down them telling any Germans left to come up. If there was no response, I fired a few shots and then threw down a Mills bomb. We got quite a few. Some came holding up their hands and shouting, Camerad. Others held up photographs of their wives and children. We had to be very quick on them, for some still had a bit of fight in them. One dugout in particular contained a large number of Germans with a couple of machine guns, and since they could not be got out, the place was set on fire. Several were killed as they came out, the others died in the fire. 
The prisoners were sent back down the line in the charge of a corporal of escort, but many got shot on the way down. The escorts told us later that many of our boys were mad with what they had gone through and the strain of it all and just shot at anything in a German uniform. It was getting dark now and although the firing seemed to have moved on we were warned that there would probably be a German counterattack. So we started to get the trench ready to resist, building up the parados into a parapet facing the enemy. This meant heaving the German dread over the top. A gruesome job which covered us with blood. This done, we waited through the night. Some explored the dugouts that were found to be well stocked with drink and cigars and came up wearing German helmets. Those who had them diverted up their rations and tried to get a little sleep through sheer exhaustion. The counter-attack never came, and next morning we were relieved. So we drifted back in small parties to find a small group that had set up on the road with Dixie's of hot soup. We asked after our friends who had got a blighted one and who had become a landowner. Then the official photographer came along, and for the benefit of those at home, we had to put on a cheerfulness which we were far from feeling. But we had done it. Deepwell had been captured. One day I was told I was to be a company runner. You were not made a lance corporal, <coughs> nor paid any more money than the shilling a, a day we all got. But I still had to join with the others in any attack. The story continues on side B. You were to be ready at any time to carry messages from the front outposts to company or battalion headquarters if the usual telephone wires broke down, as they frequently did. This was very risky business, as the call often came at night when the communication trenches were the foot of fatigue parties. So it was a case of over the top with the best of luck. There were, of course, no paths to follow. You just had to pick your way between the shell holes, usually full of water, sometimes with a dead body floating. So you had to be very careful not to slip into them through the mud. For well, once in, it was almost impossible to get out. The German lines were not far away. They sent up star shells every now and then. These lit up the countryside very brightly. And when one of them went up, they had to freeze and keep dead still. Otherwise, the least movement and a blaze of machine gun bullets came over. Another little job with the company runner was to guide the orderly officer when he come when he came 
to visit his troops at night in the front line. Ours was a very conscientious officer, and often I had to meet him at company headquarters and bring him up to the front line trenches and back again. So we often got very little sleep. The one I had most to do with was a nice young <coughs> student from Cambridge University, OTC, who was later killed. The Somme battles died down in a morass of mud up to the knee in places and cell holes <coughs> filled with water. Our battalion had suffered heavy casualties, but before we were withdrawn from the line, we were given one more job. We were told the Germans were retreating, so all we had to do was to follow them up and occupy their trenches. Unfortunately, our Germans must have got wind of what was going on and shelled us as we assembled, ready to attack at dawn. One of my friends had a leg and an arm smashed up when we got over the top to attack. We had little idea where we were supposed to go. Our platoon was in charge of a corporal, as we had no officers. Eventually, I drifted back and found there were only four survivors of our platoon. After this, we were taken out of the line and spent a quiet Christmas in Billets, near Abbeville. We were offered, in fact had to take, shower bars in the open. after which we were given a so-called change of clothes. We did not like this, for we found that the result was, instead of being lousy with our own vermin, we were given shirts with somebody else's lousy things in it. 1917 started us with the usual up to the front line or reserve and, forti and fatigues, all in the most abominable weather conditions. As a bomber, I was sometimes sent back to an ammunition dump where I spent the day detonating Mills bombs. This was a boring job with the risk that some fool would let one off and blow up the whole dump, as did, in fact, happen later on. Then one day, I was told to report to company headquarters where I was questioned about what I did in civil life and then told I was to be recommended for a commission. I would be sent back to England for training. I could never believe my luck, 
or know why I was chosen, or my, although my guess is that the officer I used to guide round the trenches had something to do with it. I did not go for several weeks, and in the meantime, I never worried so much about killed and getting killed as I did then. Eventually, I got back to England and reported to the Fusiliers headquarters in Hounslow. They would not let me stay with the camp as I was loathing as we all were in the front line. So I went out and bought some new underclothes and changed in one of the public bars and left the lousy stuff behind. <coughs> we were sent, or I was sent, to the officer's training camp at Litchfield, where we had a fairly easy time. I even played some cricket. If we misbehaved, a principal punishment held over our heads <coughs> was RTU, return to unit. That was enough to quieten us down. At the end of four months, in October 1917, we had an examination and were then commissioned. We had four choices, and I put down the Royal Fusiliers, the Gloucesters, or the Somersets, so they sent me to the East Lancashires. The 4th Battalion East Lancashire Regiment was stationed at Scarborough, having been sent there after the two German cruisers had bombed the town early in the war. We formed a guard at the harbour jetty but all we had to fight with were old Canadian rifles while the officers just had their swagger cane. The camp was run by some old regular officers who looked down on us as cadet officers. Most of our time was spent drilling recruits and taking them on group marches along the cliffs at Filey. One day, when we returned from one of these marches, and were formed up for inspection by the colonel, I was standing to attention in front of my company, when I fainted. I was picked up and soon recovered. But next morning I had an order to report to the medical officer. He was an old major, a medical man, he examined me and said my heart was bad and I must go to a convalescent camp for treatment. Actually, I was pretty exhausted by all I had gone through. So I went off to Ripon, where the only treatment I received was being given breathing exercises every morning. I had a long rest, 
Occasionally, I got in a game of football, but probably undid all the good the breathing exercises have done. Eventually, I was sent before a medical board of eight doctors who agreed I was no more use to the army and must be discharged and I was invalided out in April 1918. That is the end of my story. Have you ever been back to, to France or? No, uh, actually, I, uh, uh, you know this um, association, the bulletin they sent out there, and they see they're going to the Somme next, uh, next spring. And uh, I did wonder whether I'd, uh, uh, in three or four days, whether I should try and go. Uh, actually, I know Lynn uh, Nelson, you probably know him. Uh, he was <coughs> talking about going out sometimes. I wouldn't go out by myself, but if he went, I might be tempted to, uh, to go out and see it. Uh, the Somme is the only part, of course, that I'm really interested in. And if he was going, I might be tempted, but it just depends on the or oh, too much, you know, on the health and all that no, sort of thing. Yes, yes. And the weather and God knows what. Mm -hmm. But I, I, uh, uh, I think perhaps, I, I don't know, at one time I thought, well, I never want to see the place again. And, uh, uh I don't know. You, you, you've been out there. I don't know whether you, you, uh, think I should be disillusioned and all that, you know, that, uh, uh my memory is out there. Well, uh, you, you probably, I mean, you wouldn't recognize it, I don't no, suppose, no, no. other than perhaps the, uh, the Golden Virgin and the Albert, I mean, yeah. because that is yeah. the same. And uh, one of your photographs in your, uh, that book you claim they uh, gave me a photograph, uh, of the Teep Val Memorial, the, the rise of the ground there, it's just what I remember there, very well, that was the, you know, plowing up the dock to get up to the chateau. Uh, and of course that can't be altered. So I, I no. might, uh, sort of recognize round now. But anyway, we'll see how it feels in the, in the spring. Yes, well, uh, I mean, I think it would be an experience. Yeah, you know. oh, of course it would, yeah. I think the, uh. And it might bring back, you know, sort of oh, yeah. certain memories. I think the association is very good to run these things because, uh, there's been a lot of work for people who are, <coughs> not being paid for it, you know, uh, <coughs> organizing them and so forth. This recording was made on October the 19th, 1983. And now, to round off the tape, let's have another rendition of Reggie's song.